this meeting of the uh, Cuyahoga County Committee of the Whole to uh, consider the 2012-13 biennial budget and the uh, possible tax lien certificate sale will please come to order and the clerk will please call the roll. Calling the roll, Mr. Germana. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Tron? Ms. Conwell? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Rogers? Here. Ms. Simon? Mr. Greenspan? Here. Mr. Miller? Present. Mr. Brady? Present. Ms. Conley? Here. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Clerk, do we have anybody who has signed in for public comment? No, Mr. Uh, Chairman, there's no one signed in to speak. Okay, thank you very much. We will then proceed to item number four on the agenda, which is matters referred to the committee. The clerk will please read the resolution. Resolution number 2011-0291, a resolution adopting the 2012-2013 biennial operating budget and capital improvements program and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Okay, the uh, biennial budget resolution is bef before the committee for the fourth hearing. And we will start with the uh, Veterans Service Commission to be presented by the director, Robert Schlondorn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. It's welcome back. I was here before, and uh, this is kind of a follow-up. I apologize because you know I can't do the 2013 budget with you. Uh, we are, our budget is annual, and uh, what I planned to do is follow up on some of your questions from the last uh, hearing, if that's uh, acceptable. That would be good. Okay. One of the things that, uh, and, and I, I, will, I will tell you something, that we did a lot of our cost savings before there was a new county government. I do have to tell you that. We saved about $68,000 a year in moving to our new space, so we, we dropped 2,000 square feet of uh, space. And uh, over time, we'll save 68000 That's good. We also dropped two financial assistance employees and moved them into service officer positions. So uh, those were some things we did before you were all in place. We have decided to join the county recycling program. That will, that's something that we're currently paying for, and that will be free once we join the county's uh, project. Uh, we're going to continue with a part-time receptionist. We're not going to go any further with that. So as far as cost savings for 2012, that's pretty much it. Uh, for 2013, I can't address that till we have a full board. Again, we change board members every year. So uh, we talked about advertising last year or last May. We have been unable to spend all of our advertising dollars. We're right now about $70,000 short. Um, we're using, uh, we're going to be involved in a test with uh, the, the state. The state has been gathering veterans information on driver's licenses. If you go to renew your driver's license, they ask you if you're a veteran. That information is kept by the state and we are one of the test counties. So by April, we should have uh, the names and addresses of veterans that we can do direct mail to. So that will be good. We can sift through our current clients and probably try to get new clients into our office. Uh, okay, survey results. You asked about the surveys that we had done. Uh, since we last met, we have had uh, 2,219 visitors respond to a survey on how they heard about us. 80% of it, word of mouth. We kind of, that's intuitive, we kind of knew that up front. The VA hospital supplies 7% of our customers. Radio, 2.6. The bus ads, 5.1%. The Valpac, 3%. Uh, the internet, county internet, and uh, the 211 number accounted for one visitor each. So we, we have been surveying that. And how many did you say responded? Uh, 2,219 respondents since June. So it's from June to September, that's how many people responded. Also, uh, we have begun working with the municipal court on the veterans docket. Uh, I saw Ms. Connolly at the VA hospital. 
where they had the uh, kickoff for that. We have been uh, involved in that every Thursday since, and uh, we provide staff to preview the veterans and get them into the system. And so far we've had uh, success with all but about two veterans who tend to have dishonorable discharges. That's why we can't work with them. But there are other processes for them to go through. Uh, any questions? Okay, questions by my colleagues, and we'll start with Council President Connolly. Uh, Mr. Sorn, good afternoon. You indicated that you saved about $68,000 on your rent. Yes. But isn't your rent like $490,000 a year? Yes, it is, but it's a build out. That's the, in the first five years, you have to amortize the build out costs, and that would have been anywhere we went. So if we, the 68000 is if we had, if we had taken our 16,000 square feet that we had before and bought another 16,000 square feet, it would have been $68,000 more. We are down to 14,000 square feet. So that's the savings. So um, how many more years do you have on the build out to pay for that? I think we have uh, one more year on the build out. I think in 2014, it goes, it goes to $14 a square foot, 1475. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, there are a lot of county buildings around, and I mean, you, you're there at 19th and 18th, 19th, 18th and Prospect. Prospect. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's, it's still a lot of money that you're paying, and yes, it is. I mean, it seems to, it, it, wouldn't you consider going closer to the VA hospital? Uh, if you read the paper yesterday, I read the paper. The paper, <laughs> we, the paper. We did consider going to the VA hospital, and uh, it was cost prohibitive. And and then my other question is just a general question, and I think I asked you this when you came to see it last year. I mean, you've got this money that's supposed to go to veterans, and you're yes. one of our unique agencies that are not able to give all your money away. And we try. We try. I mean, with all these needy veterans, it seems to me that, and, and programs that we could use to assist veterans, it's just a marvel to me that you aren't able to give all your money away. If they come, we help them. Uh, we try to seek them out. We've been to the homeless meetings. We were there October 12th when the VA sponsored their homeless seminar. Uh, we picked up some more clients there. We try to get as many as we can. Uh, believe me, we, we're looking for clients. Well, I know that this has to do with your mission and the way that you're set up with the state. Um, but it's mm. my, my concern that if, um, for instance, the Veterans Service Commission would pay for a probation officer for the city or the county, or, um, the, or, or a lawyer at legal aid that would just handle veterans affairs, or those kinds of things, it seems to me that you would get essentially more bang for your buck because that money would be hiring another person and working with people. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I'd be interested in seeing the commission doing. Uh, those are things that the commissioners have talked about and will probably consider for the 2013 budget. Okay, well, I will get back with you because I just think those are, those are services. I mean, having been <clears> in the court all those years and seeing veterans that are, that are in need of services, and I know your focus has traditionally been on individual veterans. But it seems to me in this um, economy and as times change that we you perhaps you know, could switch your focus to, to, to broader services that would help different kinds of veterans. Well, uh, we, we try to do as much as we can. We're doing uh, dental. We're in, we have a co-op co with uh, a cooperative agreement with Metro Health where we mm -hmm. do dental work for veterans because the VA can't keep up with the demand. So we are looking for things to do. The probation officer uh, issue came up uh, because of the Supreme Court uh, justice, justice's involvement in that, and that's something that we're going to look at for 2013. And, and then, my, then this my last actually mm. question is, when a veteran comes in and asks for assistance, um, the decision is made essentially by the, the commissioners as to whether or not they receive services. Is that right? No, it's not. It's made by the adjudicator. The commissioners only do appeals. Okay. So the people that do the interviewing are now empowered to make the decisions. Because I have gotten some feedback mm. from, from people questioning how the decisions were made. And I'm not trying to criticize oh, your yeah. staff because I know I mean, people right. tell you all different kinds of things. But I mean, it seems to mm. me that um, I think at some point we'd like to look at how these decisions are being made as to what veterans receive. Because you know, oh, veterans sure. are saying they're not getting benefits as they are. And we just like to make sure that well, they're getting given fairly across the board. Right. You're more than welcome. All our policies are public and they're mm. online. Anybody mm. can see our policies. Uh, the, e the, the eligibility specialists follow the policies. So if they deny somebody, they're following a policy. Then, there is then an appeal process with an appeals officer. If he can make a, 
If he can make a good decision in favor of the veteran, he will. If he can't, it does go to the commissioners. And that's they, he because there's all males on your commission, is that right? There are all males on the commission, yes. Okay. But that's the appeals officer is separate. He's not a commissioner. And they're all he's? The, the, the commissioners are all he's, yes. Okay. Yeah. And there are a lot of female veterans, just you know, to point that out. Yes, there are. Okay. We had some on the board before, I think. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilman Greenspan. Thank you, sir. Just um, how much money do you anticipate returning back to the county? I heard eight hundred thousand. Seven hundred thousand this year. Seven. Yes. Seven hundred. It might be a little more, but hopefully not. And then the the advertising. Um, what's the number that you were unable to use? We spent one hundred and twenty-six out of one ninety-six. So I've, I've still got a few months to go that I would like to spend some money. So I may spend some more. And, and why were you unable to spend the aver the, the the services for the Veterans, we've heard, but the advertising. Why? It's why are it's you? difficult to get uh, to get competing bids, uh, especially with the way the county defines uh, vendors. We can only use, for instance, Clear Channel owns a lot of stations, but we can only use one Clear Channel AM station and one Clear Channel FM station. So if our demographics call for three stations and they're all Clear Channel, we can't we can't bid them. So we're kind of behind in that. Mm -hmm. Nothing I can do about it. We're, we're trying to get more and more bidders. The Mr. Chair, the rent that you're pay, you're paying four ninety a year right now. Yes, and that includes. So, <clears throat> so if I understand this, that includes you. You ought to come up with the TI to move in there, correct? Yes, we paid for the we paid for the move. And so it's about three hundred thousand a year above the base rent. For, T, for TI as far as when you amortize it out over five years, is that? Uh, no, what, I don't know what your, what TI is. What are you? Tenant improvement, your, your improvements. Oh, no, your lease. capital improvement for the initial build out. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was probably, it's the difference between $32 a square foot and fourteen seventy five times 14,000. So it probably was 300,000, yeah. 300,000 yeah. per, per well, that's what I'm trying to understand. Well, I, I don't so your your four hundred ninety thousand you're paying inc the rent. includes the rent and the build out. Yes. And for how many years was that? That's five. That's five years. So right. I'll get I'll you get, got the calculator. I'll get, I'll get some, <laughs> some, some chuckles here. What was the original rent? The What's original your, without. Okay. Yes, the rent without the rent with the improvements is thirty two dollars a square foot, I believe. Thirty four thirty eight a square foot with the build out. So that times fourteen thousand should be our four ninety. Yeah, if you got it. That's where I was going. So oh. your cost of your build out. Oh, the cost of your build out. Yes. For fourteen thousand square feet was one point five million. Yes. Okay. The and that's basically sunk because that's going to expire in twenty thirteen. Correct. Yes. So the additional savings of three hundred thousand dollars, roughly per year, in the delta, if you if you were unable to, in the difference, if you were unable to spend the 700,000, right. like, let's say everything was it, the same. You're right, it's more money in our It will be a million yes. dollars that yes. we return to the county yes. this year. Okay, all right, thank you. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, thank you. You got off easy this time. <laughs> 2013 is right around the corner for us. We will see you again in May. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. I Mr. Storm, I, yes, I know you came to us kind of at the last minute in May with your budget. We'd like to see that like late April so that we could be prepared. I called the commission in early January to alert you. Well, we were you. just getting started, but I, oh, okay. well, we'll put it on our calendar. Mr. Nani is here. We'll remind him. We'll be but happy we to get sure, it to you. We want to make sure we get that in very right. early. The, our, okay. our only uh, stumbling block there is that we have to get the numbers from the county okay. for the uh, assessment. And we'll okay. be happy to give it to you in April. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I yes. may acknowledge uh, the presence of council members Germana, Shran, and Simon who have, are now in attendance at the meeting. Well, I think that gives us 100%. Okay. Where, where did he go? Okay. We now move on to the uh, second item on the agenda for today, which is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument to be presented by Tim Daly. Good afternoon. Is this on screen yet?
Just real briefly to once again reiterate our mission statement, we do act under uh, Ohio Revised Code Section 345, uh, 13 and 14. And I'm very pleased to announce that our board has been uh, reorganized uh, with all 11 trustees, eight of whom are veterans. Um, at our first meeting, they did set their entire calendar for 2012, which has been properly posted on the county website together with our website in accordance with the public records law. And we are currently developing a working committee structure, which will properly address our long-term needs. Currently, we do have three full-time employees. Uh, one gentleman is a veteran of the United States Army. Tim Leslie is a veteran, retired veterans of the United States Navy, and myself as executive director. Our objectives, in a nutshell, is to promote the story and honor of the veterans of the Civil War that came from Cuyahoga County through a various um, programs and um, pushing for collaboration with other individuals and other organizations. Just some quick st statistics. Um, last year we had a total of 127 different events. This year we're on target for 129 different events. Um, we'll comment that we did see a decrease in our attendance this year. However, I believe that due to the uh, fluctuating nature of the commission, as we were moving in with the new charter that uh, that will rebound once again next year when we go back to a full structure. Our budget, um, I wish to thank the county for being as generous as they were. We believe that this is a very good budget that will appropriately address those needs that we have. And there are just four power issues that we would like to bring to your attention. Number one is the resolution of our water issue. As was stating in, in July of last, of this, this past July, we've had some ongoing issues with water backup. Since the, that time, we have met with the Public Works Division, and Public Works, through their investigation, believes that they have found the source of the problem, which they believe is on the City of Cleveland's property, which means that the good news is we should not incur a possible twelve to $15,000 expense to address this. However, I'm now challenged to work through with Public Works, who's been very good as a partner in trying to get this resolved with the city of Cleveland. Uh, number two, we are going to continue to look at the investigating of cost-saving measures. One of the items that I would have proposed to the board, and they have initially agreed to continue discussions and moving on, is the replacement eventually of our floral uh, flowers into um, the use of four permanent National Park Service quality signage, which will allow us to A, educate the public and B, get rid of this annual, um, annual expense. Another thing that has just recently come to my attention on Friday, um, we need to secure a service contracts for the monument security system as part of the $2 million rehab. We put in a new security system. However, um, it has just been recently discovered we do not have a service contract, and that is something that I'm working with. I'm seeking in information from our internal ICS uh, department together with Paradin Protective Services, who was the original contractor. We did have a limited one-year warranty, which began on 9-11 of 2009, and it ended on 9-11-2010. As I was not involved in those discussions, I was not made aware of this until we had an issue that brought this to my attention on Friday. So that will be something that will probably impact the budget. However, at this time, I'm not in a position to give any figures. We are working on that. And finally, um, in our discussions with Public Works, who has been a very good partner um, with us, um, we've discussed with Bonnie Teowin, uh, Michael Deaver, and Doug Dillon, the need for the establishment of a maintenance program and also preventative maintenance. And we were requested by the county engineer, Doug Dillon, if Bert Shikarian, who this um, council saw fit to put on our board, and we're very pleased to have Burge's 30 years of experience as we continue to serve as custodians of the monument. Um, he asked Burge to come up with a proposal that would deal with the long-term preservation of the monument, which are issues that need to be addressed before we can even deal with the issue of maintenance. And at this time, I would like to ask the chair for permission to turn this part of the 
presentation over to my trustee, Bert Chikirian, former county um, architect. You may proceed. This was my last project that I did for the county to save the monument, and it was in complete disrepair at the time. This was the quality. Excuse me. Could you try to speak sure. into the microphone so, yes. so everybody can hear? As you, as, as you can see, the quality of the monument, by looking at the existing conditions, was kind of deplorable. and. We solicited funds from all sources. Finally, we were able to put a, a, a project together, and we did the improvements uh, structurally, mechanically, electrically, to bring it to a museum kind of quality, including the air control, the heating system. However, it is important at this time, and I highly recommend that we develop a manual of preservation based on the standards of the Ohio Cultural Commission and based on the standards of the Department of Interior. In effect, the manual would be an operating manual for, for the staff of the monument, even to the point of maybe having uniforms, uh, the idea of making this a tourist attraction, uh, increase the visibility of the monument. I mean, these are things that should be undertaken. As part of the capital plan, Uh, by the way, this is kind of the floor plan just for yourself to kind of um, relate uh, as far as the memorial room, the central column, the two entrances. The, north, uh, the south entrance became a handicap entrance um, and that took some doing. Um, as far as the capital project, we are looking number one to the preservation manual. Two, we are looking to the upper esplanade, which I define as being this section, which is a constant source of water problems. And the actual construction is almost like a Roman construction from antiquity. What they did is they took the stone slabs and set it up on masonry arches. And there is no waterproofing underneath or anything like that, so constantly the joints have to be taken care of. So what I recommended at this time is to kind of redo all the joints, use a penetrating sealer for the, for the monument. This probably should be done every 10 years, along with the lower esplanade, which needs to have the repointing of the uh, pavers, the re restoration of the stairs at the northwest corner and the northeast corner, where you have threads that had shifted. Um, also, we are looking to make it as a tourist attraction, it would be nice to have a comprehensive signage system for the whole quadrant that is in keeping with the National Park Service. By the way, just as information for you, this monument is not a national landmark. Public Square is considered to be a national historic district. When we, if you do the preservation manual, I think the effort should include to make this a national historic landmark. You'd be eligible for funds both at the state level and at the federal level. The investment that you put in would be something like ten, fifteen thousand dollars to make this into a landmark monument. I highly recommend to do that. As far as the site work improvements, the irrigation system has to be redone. Uh, some of the trees have to be, they are having problems with the trees. As far as the pH content of the soil, that has to be investigated, trees replanted. Um, in addition, I recommend the exterior lighting of the main shaft of the column. And on, the, and on the top of the column, 
This is Schofield's wife, who was the architect of the monument and the sculptor. Up on the top, this is the Lady Liberty, and it would be nice to make this as a landmark in public square to illuminate the shaft and illuminate Lady Liberty at the top. The shaft is very important. It's made out of Quincy marble, and it has these bronze bands around that depict something like 33 Civil War battles, you know. And, and that's kind of getting lost. In addition, every five years, the exterior statuary should be treated. And that's part of this plan as well. It's a, it's a great monument. I mean, it's, and, and it has been born out of controversy as far as Cleveland is concerned, because in 1871, when the veterans got together with uh, Major Gleason, got them together after the Civil War, they wanted to build a monument. The citizens of Cleveland opposed the idea. And to them, Commodore Perry was more important. And Commodore Perry was located at the intersection of Ontario and Superior. And they did not want to relocate and allow for the uh, Civil War monument to be located here. And to the point that at one point, the architect Schofield and Major Gleason were arrested by the Cleveland police. But anyway, the monument was dedicated on July the 4th in 1894. You had Governor McKinley, who then became the President of the United States, and it was dedicated with a great deal of fanfare. Thank you. <clears throat> One other thing that I'd like to show you. Right when we finished the project, the properties magazine did a beautiful um, presentation of how we did the monument and the whole process that we went through. Okay. Any Questions by my colleagues. We'll start again with Council President Connolly. Um, thank you, Mr. Daly, for your presentation. And I'd like to thank Mr. Neil Evans, who served for many years on the, on the, uh, on the commission, uh, who was not reappointed. And Mr. Ted Prosse, who's with us, has stepped up. And I understand he's doing a wonderful job, and I'm, I'm impressed with the presentation thus far. Um, that there are a, a lot of challenges uh, that you had to face. And, um, and it looks like you're really on, on the right track. And I think that making, working uh, to make this a tourist attraction for downtown really helps the downtown area because there's certainly lots of people interested in the Civil War. And just for your information, one of the bits of trivia that I got from Mr. Daly is the statue of Lincoln, you correct me if I'm wrong, the statue of Lincoln in this monument is the only statue of Lincoln that we know where Lincoln is handing a former slave a, a rifle. That, that's currently what our right. information shows. Right, and this is, I mean, this is a very, very significant Civil War monument as opposed to all the monuments around the nation, so we have a, a real treasure here. Uh, I just would like to point out, and I brought this up before, and I'd like to point out uh, for members of, 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 the, uh, uh, of, the, of the council, um, there is a matter of some money that was donated to the um, um, monument for repairs, and that money is being held by the um, su um, support group that was formed by Mr. Evans. And I have indicated to the prosecutor and to the law department that I believe that money should be turned over to the county. And to my knowledge, it has not been turned over to the county. So I believe that the, the county should follow up on that and that this money should be transferred, it's about $250,000, that that money belongs to the county, and I, I feel very strongly that it should be turned over to the county at the earliest convenience. Mr. Daly, can you uh, comment at all on that situation? It is my understanding that the support group is the 501c3 separate um, fundraising side of the monument. Um, with regards to, um, at one time, the trustees of the monument were also the trustees of the monument support group. All of the funds that were 
currently that had been in the commission's account, namely the five hundred thousand dollars we received from the state of Ohio, together with the approximately ninety-eight thousand dollars that we received from the National Park Service. Those funds, which are were in the custodianship of the commission, have been properly turned over to the county. Um, with the reappointment of the board and the reorganization of the board, um, Mr. Evans still remains as president of the support group. Um, currently, there um, is review being done between the governing documents of the two organizations. And at this time, it is my understanding that the support group continues to be an independent organization of which I have no control over those monies. At no time was I, as executive director of either of those organizations, ever put on the accounts. So I, I personally have no control over any of the money. Can you tell me what the source of the $250,000 is? Um, it is my understanding, based upon the information since I joined the board in 2008, that it was money raised for the use of renovation. There seems to be some question as to um, if that money was supposed to go to the county, um, that is a question that I understand that the board is currently looking at. And if you would like, I'd be more than willing to ask for the chair's permission to call upon our president, Mr. Ted Prassi, who may be able to um, provide a little bit more light on this issue. Yes, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council, the, I, I don't know the exact number, but the number that is held by the support group includes a variety of donations that were done to support the monument. I don't know the amount that was specifically targeted at renovations. For example, we know there is some money that was raised to support a program, I think, as you know, Judge, an attempt to recognize uh, veterans from the county who were African American and were not allowed to enlist in Ohio regiments at the time, so enlisted in other regiments. So there are dollars there that the support group has raised. I know there's dollars, for example, to do mundane things like buy a Navy uniform or things <clears> like that. <throat> to the extent there are dollars that were allocated for the renovations, uh, I believe it's Mr. Evans' intent to get the support group approval to put that either directly into the monument or back to council. Uh, but I. As you know, I'm not in his head. Yeah, well, it's just he's had the money for a while, and we're, we're sort of strapped for funds, so you know, we, we want our money back. We, the county paid out uh, a million, a, a substantial amount of money for the renovations, yes, and this is money that was earmarked for the renovations, and I believe that money should come back. And I just want to go on record that I know about it, and I just want to make sure that other people know about it so that we can try and get our money back. Okay. Any... Uh, Councilman Rogers. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you made reference uh, in the presentation uh, about the, the need to have the monument more visible. I, and I'm wondering if um, anyone from the Soldiers and Sail Sailors Monument Board or if the executive director is working with the Group Plan Commission um, as they're moving forward in the redesign of Public Square. Um, that is not an organization that I was, it, that's even been on our radar. Currently we are working with, and I'm not opposed to adding them as a partner. Um, currently we are working with Positively Cleveland. We are working with Downtown Cleveland Alliance. We've worked with the Old Stone Church. Um, we are looking at co collaborative efforts in several different areas. Um, we are not opposed to um, extending those avenues. Um, I just would like to point out that the um, there were several things that um, I have not been given the opportunity to explore and we believe with the reorganization of the board that several opportunities to explore new avenues of cooperation will be open to me. So um, that was the, which board, sir? It's called the Group Plan Commission. Group, okay. And they're charged with um, raising money not only for uh, whatever the green space is going to look like in malls A, B, and C around the Medical Mart, but also Public Square. So they're, you know, looking to do a major redesign of Public Square, and it 
would seems to be to, to behoove you guys to make sure that your voice is heard at that table. We will make certain that we approach them tomorrow. Great. Your point is well taken because at the present time, Public Square is very dusty. It's not tourist attractive or anything like that. Recently, we were in Toronto, and we had the opportunity to visit their new police headquarters. We walked in there. They were wearing civilian suits. They looked nice and trim, and they were pleasant. They asked if, we, if they can help us. I mean, very impressive. Take that a scenario and go to the Cleveland police headquarters, and you walk inside and tell me what you see. It's a mess, dusty, half of the lights are burned out. I mean, that's one block away from public square. Good things start with little things, and that's so important. Other questions? Ms. Conroe. To the chair, to Mr. Prosser. Prosser. Um, have you had conversations with Mr. Neil Evans since you've been uh, voted in? Yes. And is there any plan that sh his organization will work with yours to raise funds? That, that was the whole issue was the 501c3 to keep it separate. So have you had conversations to? I've had conversations initially. Let me say that part of what we're trying to do as a commission ourselves is to organize ourselves. So one of the first things we've done is created a governance committee to look at what everybody on the commission thinks our role should be vis-a-vis -vis the support group. My personal opinion is that they should be separated and that we should accept support that they provide to us but not turn them into our governing group. But I want to make sure that the commission itself has that same opinion. So I would suspect we'll have an answer to that by January at our next regular meeting. So we have four committees that are working one to deal with special events. Uh, Commissioner Shikarian is working very hard with regard to the physical nature of it. Uh, we have a, a, a committee that's dealing with governance, and then the final committee is dealing with really a program called Names and Faces on the Wall, dealing with recognizing veterans. So that's really been our focus. The discussions I've had with Mr. Evans is to indicate my belief that they should be separate. It was to resign as an officer in the support group. And it was also to um, briefly discuss with him what amendments he intends to propose for his support group. Because again, it's the governance of the support group, it's the governance of the commission that we think, that I think should be separate. Hopefully I've answered your question. Yeah, we just, in my mind, I just want to make sure that, you know, he was very passionate about uh, what he did for us. So I just want to make sure that his group still will is willing to work with uh, raising funds for the... I think you've hit the nail on the head. One of the challenges with passion is that sometimes people feel slighted. I can't guarantee you whether or not that will be a casualty of the change in the governance, um, but I know Neil continues to feel passionately about the monument itself, and so I believe he will continue to work for the, you know, the, the betterment of the monument. One follow-up question of, about... Um, your meeting schedule, has it been posted, is it posted somewhere on the website or something? Yes, ma'am. Both ours and the county's. Okay. And posted within the monument as well. Okay. Ms. Simon. No. Okay. Uh, to uh, Mr. Daly. Uh, and and to Mr. Prossi. Is it Prossi? Prossi. Yes, Prossi. Sir. yes. I would like to make one recommendation, which is that uh, I know we heard the concept of having uh, having an ongoing regular maintenance plan, and uh, and what I would recommend is that you uh, commit that to writing and develop it with enough specificity so that you uh, have a plan as to. Uh, what would need to be uh, expended on what items on what schedule and uh, and you should work with the uh, fiscal office which uh, prepares the uh, 
the five-year capital improvements plan, which is required to be a part of every budget submission that we receive, and, and hopefully the, uh, the Sol Soldiers and Sailors Monument can be incorporated into the five-year plan and that we can work with you around uh, what the right way is to raise the money needed to make sure that that plan can be carried out. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, that will conclude the budget hearing for today, and, uh, and we now move on to another item that the uh, council has to deal with, and uh, that is the, uh, the question. sale by the county and to uh, make the overall presentation by regarding the tax lien sale I would ask uh, director Steen to please come forward thank you mr. chairman good afternoon uh, council members I'll be introducing the topic and giving some history and I'll be assisted in the presentation by Treasurer Sensenbrenner and his staff. They've put together a very detailed PowerPoint. I believe it's already been provided <coughs> to you that they'll walk through concerning the proposed tax lien sale. By way of background, one of the first concerns that I brought to the attention of the county executive upon my confirmation by this council was the county's delinquency rate and percentage as well as dollar. Every day since I've been here since that time, I don't think there's been one that I haven't talked about the issue. I'm a former county treasurer, as all of you know, and so I can't help but focus on it. I've provided one handout which was prepared by the Cuyahoga County Budget Commission. It looks like this. It should be in your packet. It's not on the PowerPoint. And the only reason to, to present that to you is to uh, demonstrate what I would call the, the gravity of the situation here in Cuyahoga County in terms of our delinquencies. In four years, we've gone from, I'm sorry, do you not have this? Trevor, did we not hand this out? If we can, Mr. Chair, just, just a moment. I thought that had been provided to you already. I don't know how serious I should look because I know many of our potential bidders are watching this as it streams live, as I've watched many of you during the hearings in, in my office. And I was told that some may even attend today because they wanted to hear the comments from the administration as well as questions from council concerning the proposed tax lien sale. Mr. Chair, if I may begin again. Okay. Um, what you have before you is a summary of the county's delinquent taxes at the end of each second, second half collection as compiled by the Cuyahoga County Budget Commission. And what causes me concern is that just four years ago, that total delinquency amount was just under, under $300 million. It was $297 million. When we closed collection this year, before we started our efforts to collect delinquent taxes that we're going through right now, the county's delinquent taxes totaled $566,595,372. That's approximately a 90% increase since collection year 2007. This, this is a serious problem. 
And one of the topics we're going to talk about today is, you know, the effect of a tax lien sale and other efforts versus keeping someone in their home. But I would suggest that we also consider that keeping someone in their home to have someone there who doesn't pay their taxes is just as damaging to the community. And if vacant homes impact economic development, if we allow this number to grow anymore, that will also impact economic development because businesses will question coming to a place where delinquent taxes are on the rise this much. So we're going to talk about the proposed tax lien sale today. And it's not the answer by itself. It's just one of the tools that we're putting before you to consider to get this delinquent tax situation under control. As I mentioned, County Treasurer Sensenbrenner and his staff will provide a detailed overview. But if I can give you a summary, there are two options currently allowed in the Ohio Revised Code for County Treasurers to put forth a uh, tax certificate sale, a competitively bid situation and a negotiated situation. And first I should step back. Because of the change in government, we actually have a much more open process. If we were in 86 other counties, not counting Summit, the way a tax lien sale occurs is that the county treasurer, in and of themselves, can pick any properties they want to sell, can pick up the phone and call one person and sell those tax liens with no oversight, no control, no mechanisms, no conversation like we've had here. That's the way the state law is written today. We chose the negotiated option because it provides more flexibility and leverage to the county. Uh, <clears throat> The treasurer's staff have heard me say since I've gotten here, I want a successful sale and I want an effective sale. And by that I don't mean just dollars. We've looked at all the past tax certificate sales Cuyahoga County's been involved with. We've looked at the past tax certificate sales that other counties have been involved with and tried to identify problems, shortcomings, things that could be done to improve our sales so that it would be, would it be better. We've engaged the community, as all of you know, County Executive Fitzgerald appointed a task force to look at this matter, and the task force included the County Executive, myself, Treasurer Sensenbrenner, Council President Connolly, Cleveland City Councilman Tony Brancatelli, Shaker Heights School Superintendent Mark Freeman, Lakewood Mayor Mike Summers, Kamala Lewis, who's involved with the VAPAC group, as well as Shari Feltman from the Cuyahoga County Public Library. That task force heard two presentations on this particular idea, and I, I think I'm fair in saying they unanim unanimously supported going forward with a tax certificate sale. I've also personally met with the representatives from VAPAC, the Cuyahoga County Library Association. We've talked with numerous municipalities. We've had conversations, numerous conversations with the city of Cleveland um, and their economic development team, as well as individual council members. We've talked with other interested parties We've tried to get the best possible list, but I would, I would offer that there are probably some groups we didn't talk to, and for that we'll try to improve because we want to get all the input we can. I'll also offer that we didn't take every suggestion because at the end of the day, it's the county's determination what makes the best um, portfolio to put into the tax lien sale. And as an example, one of the properties that was asked to be pulled was asked by a municipality and we looked at it because I said, let's just run a list of the properties over $250,000 in this community that haven't paid their taxes for two years, which is our criteria, and Treasurer Sensenbrenner will go through that. There was a home they wanted pulled that had an auditor's value of $490,000. That was more than two years delinquent in taxes. My guess is we can sell that tax lien and that house is not going to fall vacant or into disrepair if it's worth $490,000. In fact, it's probably a pretty good likelihood that we'll collect those taxes. But we're going to go through the criteria that we use to try to give you the best possible list to put forward for a sale. But at the end, what I've suggested to the staff is that this will be a successful sale if we can collect as much delinquent tax as possible while protecting the county's interest and also making sure that those delinquent taxpayers, their taxpayers, even though they're delinquent, are treated fairly and with respect and how we go about that collection process. And, and with that, I would like to invite um, Treasurer Sensenbrenner up to go through the PowerPoint, and then we would be glad to take any questions about how we've constructed this sale uh, in hopes of earning your support today. Thank you, Wade. Thank you, Wade. Mr. Chair and Council Members, thank you. Uh, for having us here today. Uh, 
Before I begin, I would just like to introduce two of my senior staff members who are very critical in this effort. And what comes to the question and answer period uh, will maybe prove very helpful in some of their expertise and insight they have. The first uh, member of my team I'd like to introduce is Michael Sweeney. And Michael, as many of you may know, is a 22-year veteran of the county treasurer's office, and he is the administrator of the city's tax department. Also with Michael is Christy Neff. Thank you. And Christy is the supervisor of the county's tax certificate sale program, and she has been the supervisor of this program since its inception in 1998. So now I'm going to try to quickly walk through this pro, uh, presentation, this PowerPoint presentation with you. I'm going to just focus on a few pages. Yes, sir? Mr. Treasurer, before you start, have you sent a copy of the PowerPoint to our office? Yes, yes. We have it? Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not going to hit every page. I'm just going to try to hit the most important pages and the most important points on those pages. A lot of what I'll skip is simply verbatim right out of the Ohio Revised Code. So if you would, I'm going to go to page four. Oh. Page four and start on page four. Because we often talk about the importance of exemptions. What are we exempting um, uh, before we get to the final list? Now, page four is specifically the exemptions of the parcels we take out because of the Ohio Vice Code. And as you can see, the three bullet points there, the first one's pretty obvious. If everything's paid, we don't include, uh, we don't include those parcels. And that's, I put that there, that's straight out of the Ohio Vice Code, so that goes in there. Um, the second one, though, is if there's a valid contract or payment plan on a parcel. They could be delinquent, but as long as they've come in and has a payment plan with us, we will exclude it, and bankruptcy. So those are right out of the Ohio Revised Code. But as I go to this next page, this is what we often talk about in more detail. The, the page five and page eight might be the two most important pages in this presentation because these are additional exclusions or on page eight terms that the county has included in this tax sell process that, that really addresses many of the criticisms that are leveled at counties when they do tax certificate sales. So on page five, let's just look at a couple of the more critical exclusions. If you would go down to the third bullet point, you may want to note or circle that bullet point. This is the lien to value cannot be greater than 10% or Kind of to put it another way, the lien cannot be greater than 10% of the value of that house. And the reason that is in there, and the reason that is important, is because if the lien is too large compared to the value of the house, the collectability obviously becomes very doubtful. So in that case, we really want to look at other avenues to address that situation, such as payment plans, such as looking at the 294 foreclosure process through our land banks, and our traditional foreclosure program. One bullet point down, bullet point four, just note that any old delinquencies we don't include, in this case, anything 2006 or older. <coughs> bullet point six, um, any small del delinquencies we do not include, anything under $2,000. Bullet point number eight is pretty similar that Anything, any parcels with little value to begin with, we don't include, in this case, anything under $10,000. Also note, and I'm sorry I didn't have these bullet points numbered for you, but on, on number five and number seven are pretty similar. Any pending exemptions or any Board of Revision applications, those are excluded also. And there is an important bullet point, which isn't on here, but I do want to add, and that is um, any city requests, we obviously work, or we have this time, worked very hard with all the cities to get them the, ta the, the listing of the parcels so that they can go through there and, and pull out parcels that they want, don't, do not want included. And two examples of that are parcels that they would rather have go to, through the 294 land bank process or 
uh, or they just don't want in the cell. An example of that might be they have a targeted area in their neighborhood for redevelopment and they don't want um, a, 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 uh, this mechanism to slow down that process. Moving on, if you would, uh, page, I'm gonna go to page seven. Uh, a, a minor but important point, uh, on page seven, you'll see in the first square there that the administration fees that are gonna be levied by the county for this process are only $250. Now I say only $250 because if you do go down to the last uh, square there on the page, you'll see that this compares very favorably to our peer counties across Ohio. Now I'm gonna to go to the next page, page eight. And as I mentioned earlier, this page, I feel page eight and page five are the real critical pages uh, as we approach uh, and, and look for your approval for this cell. Because again, it was, it was those, exclu those additional exclusions and these additional terms that the county is putting on this cell that really go to the heart of, of most of the criticisms that, that you will hear regarding this cell. And again, I just wanna hit a couple of these. If you go to the second box, Again, the, please remember that the property owner can enter a payment plan with the county at any time within one year of the certificate cell. And they are notified of this fact, of course, both in the pre-sale notice that they receive via certified mail and in the post-sale notice once the sale occurs. The the next bullet, or the fourth bullet point I just want to note, and I, I think this is an important one, that the county, that we will retain the, the servicing of these certificates, whether it's the payments or the ultimate redemption. And that's important because it allows us, the county, to keep tabs on all these parcels. In some cases, you might have a county that turns those servicing efforts over to the third party provider. And then the, the parcel owner, the property owner, the taxpayer, or a neighborhood group or an elected official or even a treasurer in this case could say, hey, what's going on that, on that parcel? You know, have they paid? Are they paying? What is going on? And, and we lose control of, you know, we're, we're at the behest uh, of the third party provider to find out what's going on. So it's very important that, that we retain control and we always have from the very beginning going back to 1998. The fifth bullet point down uh, is an important addition uh, to this process, and that is that the purchaser must pay all future taxes while they hold that certificate for the following two years. So that parcel won't immediately or at the very next tax cycle, cycle fall back into a delinquent situation. Number six is uh, an important, again, a very important addition to the process, is that the certificate will only be good for no more than three years. Therefore, let's say nothing happens for three years. There's no redemption by the property owner or there's no foreclosure by the purchaser of the tax certificate. Then what happens? What happens is the certificate is terminated and the property owner gets a completely fresh start. Next bullet point down, bullet point seven. Um, this is, an, again, another important adder for the protection of our taxpayer out there, our property owner, that any foreclosure costs applied by the purchaser cannot be dumped onto the property on day one that the foreclosure process begins, but it must be tiered throughout the foreclosure process as costs are incurred. I wanna, if you would, uh, move to page nine regarding interest that can be charged. And I don't, I, I just wanna really add a, a, a point which most of you may know, and that is that, that the interest cannot be greater than 18% that's charged in any one year for any parcel, and that is per the Ohio Vice Code. Oh, I apologize, I need to move my screen. Page nine, page 10. Foreclosure, 
Again, right the very first line there is probably the most important line to focus on. Please note that the foreclosure process cannot occur until one year after the sale date of the certificate. Next page, page 11. Can you repeat that? Sure, sure. Uh, again, foreclosure. So we, if we have a sale on uh, Monday, this upcoming Monday, and a parcel is included in that sale, the, the purchaser of that certificate cannot foreclose on that parcel for one entire year. And during that one entire year, that, that parcel owner can work with the treasurer's office to enter a payment plan to, to remedy or, or to redeem or to pay off that debt. Page 11. On the, on the right to redeem. And th this goes in right uh, to the councilman's question. Um, the property owner not only can pay off their debt, other co otherwise referred to as the right of redemption or the right to redeem, um, up until that one-year foreclosure, but they can actually, even after that foreclosure is started, they can redeem all the way up until the very first share of sale. So, so if that occurs, if, if, and that occurs a lot, if all of a sudden, a, uh, a property owner may take no action upon the sale because they don't realize the in, impending situation. But once they get that foreclosure notice, you'll see an influx of payments coming in to, to redeem. And you can do that after foreclosure all the way up to the sheriff's sale. So, can I interject? Mm -hmm. So after that sale, if, if they start making payments, does that mean that it doesn't go to foreclosure? It stops the process once they start making payments. Uh, to the councilwoman through okay. through the chair, um, the at if they make a payment through the treasurer's office within that one year time period, we will hold that money in escrow, and they have to pay that. You know they have to make full payment by the time that one year is up, and if so, then we're good. No delinquency, it's, it's satisfied. Now, um, if, let's say they're $10 short when that one year's up, unfortunately, they have not had full redemption or they have not paid the full amount. So we'll take what's in escrow, give it back to the property owner, and they will then, at that point, have to work with the purchaser to possibly enter a payment plan with the purchaser at that point or make arrangements with the purchaser. But then, then the negotiation goes to, from us and it, and it transfers to the purchaser of the tax certificate. Okay. If you'd move to page 12. And I just want to summarize really the second and third bullet point on this page, which is important, that, that if after two unsuccessful sheriff sales, at that point, the property will then forfeit to the certificate holder. Now moving on to the last page of the PowerPoint, important dates. The, I wanna point three important dates out here. The fourth one down, Bids this Friday, bids are due this Friday into the treasurer's office. Two down from that are the sixth bullet point, council consideration. Administration's obviously very um, hopeful in a positive council consideration in the legislation uh, that has been presented before you. And then right below that, the last bullet point, if all goes successful, at that point we should receive a significant wire into the county treasurer's office, hopefully between five to $10 million. Uh, I, I would like to make a side note on that, on, uh, on the five, let's say we get $5 million in our door come Monday in terms of the distribution of that. Um, if we get $5 million, and this is according to our budget office, which I went and had them run the numbers for me, um, first of all, 
of that $5 million, or 250000 goes toward, it's evenly split between the prosecutor's office and the treasurer's office. And those funds, that 5%, those funds are for those two offices to again pursue and process delinquent uh, property taxes. The remaining, of course, the remaining bulk, 4.75, let's say, goes, of course, appropriately to all the districts. Now, specifically, when you go to drill down all the way to the county's general fund, that'll be approximately $34,000. Now, I don't have, to somewhat conclude, um, I, I don't have this in the PowerPoint, I apologize. I just wanted to give some, some numbers, some facts to you know, where we started and where we're at now. We really um, started in the beginning of September, or I take that back around September 23rd to be exact, we started with a full population of delinquent parcels in this county of about 69,000 delinquent parcels. Through all those discussions, or through all those exclusions that we discussed earlier in the, in the PowerPoint, that got narrowed down to around 8,100, 8,100 or 8,100 parcels through all those dis, uh, exclusions that we discussed. And that would be fairly typical with past sales that the counties had in the past in terms of starting, probably the starting point was a little lower, but in terms of the amount that were excluded and the ending amount that actually went out for sale. Now, since that date of September 23rd, 1,700 parcels or thereabouts have been taken off that, that document that's going to go out for bid. The reason why are basically three reasons. One, payment in full, obviously. Uh, I might note that that equates to about $1.2 million for that time period. The second is payment plans. People are obviously coming in and, and setting up payment plans if they can't pay in full. And that's about, about 1,200 payment plans have been set up in just that time period for totaling about $6.4 million. And then also the other big chunk of, of reductions is city requests because we've been aggressively working with the various cities across the county to say, hey, what do you want to pull from here? And so overall, we've had 1,700, and we do have uh, we do have over a thousand more that will be pulled out that we just received today from the city of Cleveland that will also that will also come off this list. So with that, I might point out that the treasurer's office, the staff of the treasurer's office, will be extremely busy in this next couple days as 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 this deadline approaches for people to, of course. Uh, enter contracts and pay in full. And often as you walk through the county building over the next couple of days, and you may have seen it a little bit today and this week even, you'll often see people coming out of the door there and actually in the hallway there. Um, and of course we and, and, and the staff of the treasurer's office do everything humanly possible we can to make their wait as is, is as pleasant as possible, even though it's a very unpleasant situation, but we try to provide reading materials and things like that because you know, they'll take a number, we'll go sequentially, but it does take a while and we will be putting in a few late nights. So with that, um, I would like to thank you for your time today and certainly uh, I'm willing, and my and staff and wait are willing to take questions either now or if you have some speakers after your speakers. Uh, do we have other speakers? Okay, we'll start with. Do we take questions first? What do you think? We'll take questions first. Uh, Councilman Rogers and then Brady. Yes. Uh, it. It might be helpful in terms of the discussion as well. Uh, it uh, came to my attention um, uh, just a few hours ago um, that um, a lot of um, um, folks in, this, in, the, um, in the CDC world uh, in my district um, and the nonprofit world in my district that are involved in these issues um, have must have been some kind of a communication gap of some kind. They have not been. Uh, brought into the loop uh, and have not been in parts of the discussion, although it's quite obvious that many people who 
who I recognize and, and uh, read about in the paper today, uh, you know, have been. And um, the, um, the director of um, the Detroit Troy organization is, is, is here today, and this is no surprise to, to Mr. Stinson, Brenner, or Mr. Steen. I spoke to them about uh, 45 minutes to an hour ago about this. Um, and um, uh, I, there's, we just need to do some drilling down here to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, because these, these are people who work day in and day out on these issues. And um, I guess we've got a, a little more work to do in terms of communicating with some of the people at the grassroots level um, about, this, um, about this sale. Uh, so it would be up to the, to the chairman and the committee as to uh, how you want to proceed. But I want you to know that, the, that uh, I've received several uh, notifications from um, nonprofits on the, west side of the, on the west side of the city and others um, who um, are not in the loop on this. Mr. Chair? Yes. If, um, if I could have the floor real quick, I yeah. believe Mr. Steen would like to say a few words. Okay. Um, thank you. Mr. Chair, to, uh, through the chair to the councilman's point, uh, that is correct. It, we've been advised some CDCs did not uh, see the list. Um, if I had to guess how many groups we spoke with, it would be more than 10, less than 20. Um, I guess I was counting on Chris Warren, I guess, who has the, the, the mayor's ear, and he's their economic development person. Um, and he's signed off on the list. He's seen it. We've had numerous conversations, but um, Council Member Brady is correct. There were CDCs that did not necessarily see the list. Um, and so we are trying to talk with them now to see if there are parcels that we might have missed that they would like to have excluded for economic development purposes or they're vacant and blighted. And so we're trying to get that done as quickly as we can. But he is accurate. We had counted on the mayor's office to help us with that. Okay, uh, I think at this point we will uh, ask if there are uh, uh, CDC representatives or other members of the public who would like to uh, address the council. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Jeffrey Ramsey has signed in to speak. Okay, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of council. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to say that we support the sale of tax liens if the list is properly vetted, which, is not, which has been a problem in the past. We have not seen the list, so we've not participated in the vetting. It's my understanding that the Department of Community Development did review the list and offer some recommendations. However, we have not been a part of that. And I spoke with Colleen Gilson, the executive director of the Cleveland Neighborhood Development Coalition today, and she said that she has not seen this list. They ordinarily, uh, forward list to the C to CDCs through uh, CNDC. And so I would hope that, uh, I spoke with Mike Sweeney today. He said he would allow me to review the list tomorrow morning and get back to him right away. I would hope that same opportunity would be provided to other CDCs through CNDC so that everyone gets a chance to review this list. I'll just comment briefly that uh, in the 2008 sale uh, in the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood, there were 18 properties that uh, were sold and not one of those has gone through foreclosure yet. Uh, out of those 18 properties, three were vacant lots, nine are vacant houses, four of which are boarded, and only six are occupied homes. And these are houses uh, that are badly deteriorated, such as this property at 1875 West 54th Street next to St. Stephen's Church and Metro Catholic School, uh, where the property is wide open today. This is a threat to the school children going to Metro Catholic and yet another expense borne by the city of Cleveland in securing and boarding these vacant properties. Uh, the vacant lots need, are, have to be cut by the city of Cleveland. Um, I have other photos of properties that have missing siding that are badly deteriorated, and the majority of these homes are very low value and need to be demolished. So uh, I would just ask with the courtesy to be able to, to participate in the vetting process so that we can uh, stop some of these uh, vacant houses and vacant lots from being on the, on the sold at tax sale. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Clerk, do we have more? That's all I have. Okay, is there anybody else that would like to address the uh, council on this subject? Okay. Can, uh, I, uh, can I say one word, uh, Councilman? Yes. Uh, or more than one word, but just one, uh, express one uh, thought. 
I, I, don't, I don't think Treasurer Sensenbrenner mentioned this, but there is a possibility of, of there being no responsive uh, bidders to the sale. We talked about this a little, about, a little bit at the Board of Control, but we didn't talk about it in front of the full, full council. The more restrictions uh, that you place on, on uh, or the parameters that you place on a tax lien sale, the, the, the smaller your pool of potential uh, bidders will be for that. And I think in recent weeks there ha there has been a lack of bidders uh, in a package that was put out by uh, Mahoning County, I believe. Um, and then Summit County also had some restrictions and there was a successful bidder. So there is a chance, I just, the council should know, there is a chance that there will not be a, a responsive bidder. We'll just have to see what the market, how the market responds to that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Councilman Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Fitzgerald and his staff for their work on this. Um, as you know, Mr. Simpson-Burner, during your uh, confirmation hearing, I brought up this subject, and this was something that um, is important to me, and I feel that, you know, at the time that I was against uh, these tax, tax lien sales. Um, and primarily the problem was is the business practices of the people that we were selling this to. The, the common practice was that you would, <clears throat> uh, they would send out one notification to a homeowner that they had bought the lien, and then the homeowner wouldn't hear anything until it came time for foreclosure. And at that point, then they can add on the additional fees, the $2,500 fee, mm -hmm. and um, more than likely get the, uh, get the attention of the, uh, of the homeowner. And normally, when you owe someone money, when you owe your credit card money, they're sending you a notification you know, every week, you owe this, you owe this, you owe this. And it's really easy in the, you know, the, the bulk of mail that people get on a daily basis. If you Absolutely. miss that one notification that they gave you, um, and then next thing you know, you, you may have missed a, a $1,000 uh, tax payment, and then you're getting a bill in the mail uh, once it goes into foreclosure for you know five eight thousand and it's at plus the eighteen percent fee that they right. put on to this so you know the idea that that they have to give four notifications a year mm -hmm. right. um, um, and all of the other things you listed on these terms and conditions, I think really help to um, address those kind of backdoor issues that I saw that the um, you know, some of these companies, mm -hmm. I can't say all, um, were practicing. And I, I think that, um, you know, with that, that we, may, we may find ourselves in a position where no one may bid on this, but um, if that's the case, that's the case. Um, but I, I do want to applaud your efforts in, in addressing those issues, because I think it's really important. Yeah, to the council member, to the chair, uh, thank you for those comments, and, and I, I I, I got in on the tail end of this process, so uh, your your thanks really needs directed to the to the executive and to uh, to Wade Steen and his effort and to the staff that that I brought along today. They've they've done a tremendous job of taking all the critiques that were out there and really trying to mold it into the to the best package possible. Thank you, Ms. Simon. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a question regarding the CDC's. Um, Director Steen indicated that he had contacted um, several of the CDCs and, and what has been the response overall from the ones you have contacted and had discussions about the county exclusions? Okay. Uh, to the council member through the chair, we contacted, uh, I want to correct that, it wasn't directly to the CDCs, it was the economic development directors in communities and one of the things I'm learning is, all of you know, I'm, I'm new to Cuyahoga County and I thought I had all my bases covered with municipalities and Mayor Jackson and economic development directors and VAPAC, um, but there were a couple of groups that, um, and, and, and working with Council Member Brady, that we're going to make sure in the future that all of the parties know about it. So there are some CDCs that did not get notified. The response is that they're going to look at the list tomorrow. We're going to work with them on taking out any additional parcels that should not be in the sale. We want the best sale possible, so we'll take them out if they identify parcels that shouldn't be there. Based on what, Mr. Chair, to the director? I mean, how they, they shouldn't be in there based upon these exclusions you're setting forth or based upon their, their needs and priorities in their particular district? 
to the council uh, woman through the chair their needs and priorities if there's a parcel that is maybe targeted for economic development that we didn't know about and they would say we would like this pulled out because we have plans for that it might be one that's on the list that we would take out if it hasn't already been taken out. Shouldn't we then therefore put something in the exclusions that, that represent these desires and priorities going forward instead of just having ongoing discussions about which properties they may or may not want? I think that we should have standards set going forward that are uniform. Um, to the councilman, through the chair. Those, the, the, the exclusions were the exclusions that we took our 69,000 parcels, that's how we got to 8,000. Um, and then as uh, I think council member Brancatelli would tell you if he were here, he knows his neighborhood. He looks at that list and just because they meet all of our criteria, he would know something about a particular property in his district that he would bring to our attention. We would take that out of the sale. Maybe it is a vacant home that we didn't catch through any other means and it was not brought to our attention. Or maybe it's a parcel that an economic development director or a CDC has plans on developing. We would wanna take that out and put it through another process to get it in their hands. So you, you use the exclusions to establish the, the universe and then you try to take out those in the universe that have potential other needs. Mr. Sheriff, to the, that seems like an awfully subjective way to go forward. Maybe I'm missing something. So ongoing properties that are delinquent with their taxes, are you going to meet with these individuals before you exclude them? Or is there a way, to, is it gonna be an ongoing case by case analysis? To, to make a determination of whether they're gonna be sold, the tax certificate liens. Am I missing something? To the, sounds, cons to the consumer through the chair, I'm not sure I understand the question. Once we've determined the number of parcels, those are sold, there's no additional new sale. You won't go through this evaluation process again until you do another sale in a year. You had to come up with a portfolio and that's what we're doing is just to So establish. every year, this is what I'm trying to get at, you are going to look at this, make your own list of exclusions based upon whatever criteria you, you look at, but then as well, you're gonna meet with individual CDC reps and determine whether there should be exclusions on an annual basis. Now I've got your question, Councilman, through the chair. That is correct. If we were to do a sale next year, we would start with those exclusions, meet with the CDCs, meet with the economic development directors, meet with the city, again, to say, have things changed because there might be new parcels that have come into place. So yeah, we'll, this is a very laborious process and um, we'll go through it every year, maybe twice a year until we can get the $560 million tax delinquency number under control. That's really the drivers to try to use this as a tool to manage that, but we'll go through all that work every time we do this. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just talking out loud. I think maybe we should have something more than a subjective need basis on when we look at these annually, and maybe try to define what would be eligible for exclusion more than you have here. I guess that's what I'm saying. I understand, Councilwoman. Thank you. Other questions, uh, Councilman Greenspan. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The. You mentioned earlier about communications with the local municipalities as far as the tax liens or, or tax lien sales. What's that process now and how will that be strengthened in the future? To the chair, or to the councilman through the chair, um, it's an example of when I went through the numbers and currently we're down to about 6,400 parcels from originally 81. Well, just today, we received from the city of Cleveland another pullback of about, uh, I wanna say about 1,800, is, uh, is that right, Michael? Yes, sir, 1873. 1873 parcels that in addition will be excluded. And the process really is getting the list to the cities so their economic development directors and their prof their professionals can can uh, can of course sort through that, and they look for a number of criteria, of which I can probably name just a few. But there are various surveys. Like one survey that the city of Cleveland really hung its hat on was a survey that was done, I want to say earlier this year on the postal vacancy or, or, or postal survey, I think they call it, where re returned mail was it, as it was a return mail survey, assuming that if there's a return mail via postal service, that there's a, a vacancy at that house. And then they had, they actually had a more intensive drive-by survey where they actually, uh, and I believe that was also this year, is that correct, Michael? 
the, where they also did that. And so when the city of Cleveland, you know, they have various tools, including their own staff, their own code enforcement officers, et cetera, but they have various tools together. So they get our list of 8,100 and they obviously share it and they, they, they each have a, a plan in place, uh, which the councilman mentioned, maybe there needs to be uh, uh, maybe some better criteria among these, uh, among our city partners and maybe we can suggest them but ultimately it is in their hands to get back to us and say okay here's the list please exclude this and as i mentioned before uh we're, we're just in the process via a, a very aggressive scrub by the city of cleveland to take off another 1800. Okay. I, I hope that kind of went well, to your question mr chair outside of the city of cleveland how do you communicate with the other 58 municipalities and political subdivisions do you send a letter and here you say here are the community here are the Properties, email. There's, there's, there is a communication, so, and it Correct. goes to the mayors, the economic development directors. Who does it go to? Correct. That would be uh, to the uh, to the councilman through the chair. That would be done via email through our tax division via Michael Sweeney to the various uh, municipalities via email, so they have an Excel spreadsheet that they can easily, you know, sort through and, you know. Uh, analyze and get us back electronically what they need parsed out. Is that a new process or is that a continuation nope. of the existing process? That is a continuation of the existing process. Okay. The, look, Mr. Chairman, a couple questions here. The, what, what impact do tax lien sales have on property values and appraisals within the community? Uh, to the councilman through the chair. Um, I, I, I want to kind of answer that, and, and obviously uh, I'll defer to Wade Steen if he'd like to come up, or the executive. But Wade kind of mentioned earlier, there's really, in his comments, there's really two, twofold. One, and that's what we tried to address with our exclusions and our terms. If, if, if it doesn't unwind successfully, you could have a vacant property. And obviously a vacant property does not help the property values in the neighborhood. Now be aware that even if it, we chose not to go through the tax lien sale, I mean, the ultimate process would possibly be a 294 process through a land bank, which would be ideal, or just the traditional foreclosure process, because obviously the land banks can't take everything out there. And so the traditional foreclosure process will end up eventually at the same place that the tax lien sell will, except, of course, the taxing districts won't receive any money. Point two, though, is uh, Mr. Steen uh, pointed out, though, is truly that delinquency re rate. We got to use all our tools that are available for us to, to, to stem the tide, to stop the tide, to reverse the tide of delinquencies in this county for the overall credit worthiness of the county and for the overall business climate and residential climate of the community. Mr. Chair, if I may address the councilman's question. Um, it's quite simple. I think if a tax certificate sale is done correctly, it does not impact the values. If um, you had the chance to read the article in the um, Plain Dealer today, I think that was the conclusion the Plain Dealer came to after looking at homes that were included in a tax lien sale um, back in 2008, they did a survey of 50 homes, and this sale is more restrictive and tighter than that one. So I, I do not believe, and I wouldn't be proposing a tax certificate sale as your fiscal officer if I thought it was going to undermine and destroy neighborhoods uh, at all. I don't think it has that value. If done, it, it has that out effect if done correctly. Okay, thank you. The, the, Mr. Chair, the, I'm assuming that all of these bidders have been registered with the Inspector General that have been through ethics training, correct? Um, to the councilman through the chair, we will receive uh, due when tomorrow we'll get all the references, and that's when we'll do our due diligence to make sure all those questions are answered. Because pursuant to our ordinances, mm -hmm. no one can even bid on projects with the county until they have been registered and successfully completed ethics training. So I want to make sure that that's oh. being followed, and it looks like we've got a deadline tomorrow, so it might be a chink in the armor there okay, the, thank you the other um, couple other questions is is the authority to proceed with this program um, I'm unclear as to where that resides is that a ORC treasurer designation and you don't need council's consent to move forward with that is that the protocol here 
No, I, the one thing I just wanted to, to, to clarify is the Inspector General registration requirements go into effect January 1, 2012. Uh, so this is happening before then, but obviously today we want everybody trained, we're training everybody, uh, but uh, the, 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 the requirement to be registered before bidding goes into effect January 1, okay. 2012. Uh, sure. The the uh, multiple re number one is exactly the Ohio Revised Code does have a specific procedure uh, where the uh, county treasurer uh, can uh, sell the the tax liens. Um, the Revised Code, however, speaks in permissive terms, not in mandatory terms. So, in that capacity, we're not necessarily acting in it as an instrumentality of the state, but this is something that we can do. Uh, which means that would be subject to home rule. And uh, our contracting ordinance is very specific in terms of requiring all contracts. It, it provides the procedure in terms of the approval process for all procedures, which is why uh, we wanted to make sure that we don't run afoul of our contracting ordinance, that it does come uh, before the county council for approval based on the contracting and purchasing procedures <laughs> ordinance. So we are really taking everything possible to, to go above and beyond any requirement to make sure that there is no, with what's at stake here, we don't want to take any risk uh, that we had any missteps. So we're, we're, we're doing it under the revised code, but also making sure uh, that there is council approval because the contracting ordinance says that does not have an exclusion for this. It says all contracts. This is the way that they get, uh, that they get approved. So, so Mr. Chair, so as, as I understand this, then these go out to bid, the con you enter into a potential contract, comes back to council for approval to move forward with the actual sale. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and one, one final question. Do you have the breakdown when, when this money starts being collected, these tax lien sales, how much the county, city, school boards, and other, do you have the percentages as to mm -hmm. what those are? To the council member through the chair, yeah, roughly 60% of all the money's collected will go out to school districts. We ran the Cleveland schools because we've been reading about their challenges in the paper, about 22% of what we would collect. So if you just think a $10 million tax lien sale, that's $2.2 million that would go to them. $5 million tax sale, $1.1 $1 .1 million. And I know that that's the, that's the kind of check and the kind of money I would assume that our, that our largest school district in, the, in this county could use. So that's one of the drivers. But that, that was one because we calculated that for the Cleveland schools, 60% roughly um, school districts throughout the county. Um, Rich gave you the number about $34,000 to us, 5% to DTAC. The rest is spread throughout um, libraries, um, community uh, services, the HHS levy, and others. Okay, would it be possible to get a breakdown of the exact percentages? Um, absolutely. Okay, Council thank you. Member. And, and I have no further questions. Okay. Uh, Mr. Treasurer, uh, I asked you to... Uh, to come up with a breakdown, which you did, re regarding our, our tax delinquencies around the question of how many of the tax delinquencies are uh, in dispute over whether they're nonprofit, how many are under payment plans, how many are, uh, are uh, in front of the Board of Revision and, and such categories. and. Uh, I would like if you could uh, kind of summarize that for us and give us some idea of uh, out of the $566 million in, in tax delinquencies, how much of that might even re remotely conceivably be collectible? Mr. Chair, uh, Thanks for the challenging question there. I try. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going a little bit on memory, but I'll obviously follow up after this meeting with some more specificity. Um, but as I recall from that analysis about, I want to say, and, and, and if, if, uh, if uh, Mr. Steen wants to correct me or, or Mike, uh, Michael, or uh, please do, um, but I want to say about half of that or a significant chunk of that $566 million are in some sort of exemption process, whether they're looking for an exemption because of the Cleveland Clinic 
or nonprofit, um, or they have a board of revision uh, application pending where they're arguing the tax value of their home, which still may, may mean they owe us money, but they, if they are successful, they may owe us less, um, or bankruptcy. So a significant chunk of that 566, in my memory, and I'll get, I'll get back to you on exact, is, was maybe even close to half of that. Now, out of that, that's where our challenge occurs. That's where our challenge occurs. Now, obviously, our goal is to get as many of those people as, in contracts as we can. Collectability, when you say um, the delinquency, ultimate delinquency after we've tried every effort possible, I have to admit that's probably a number I want to get back to you on. I, I would be a little hesitant to, 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 uh, to give you a, a figure right here. Mr. Treasurer, you said that about half is in some kind of exemption process. Mm -hmm. That would be a tax exempt board of revision bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And and how much how much additional of that delinquency is already currently in a payment plan? Oh, again, I apologize, Mr. Chair. I just don't have that figure in front of me. Okay. Well, the uh, the point that I'm making is is mm -hmm. that if you uh, if you exclude those things that that we know are not uh, uh, subject to success under more aggressive collection mm -hmm. processes, the universe that you're working with is considerably smaller. That's that's the only point that I'm making. The uh, excellent point. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I know you had another question, but I wanted to elaborate because the question you did ask was actually brought up at the Delinquent Tax Task Force. One of the questions was the amount of property in Cuyahoga County that's currently tax exempt, and how does that compare to pure counties like Franklin County and Hamilton County? And President Connolly's on that committee, she remembers this. It was surprising to some of the members. The percentage that's tax exempt in this county is actually a little bit lower than Franklin County and others, even though we have the Cleveland Clinic um, Franklin County has Ohio State University, so we weren't terribly out of line in that end. Uh, the other part, someone may be delinquent, but if they're on a payment plan, they're still delinquent, but we just can't go pursue them. So uh, you're absolutely correct. Mr. Chair, as you shrink that universe of who we can go pursue, it's small, but there are other delinquencies, um, delinquent experts that we want to keep working with, be they on a payment plan or resolving their border vision case by working the backlog um, so that we can try to get as much uh, tax money collected as possible. My second question is relates around the fact that you're uh, you're re ready under ten percent of the parcels, in that you started with sixty nine thousand and you got to eighty one hundred and you took off some more and you said you're now at mm -hmm. six thousand something plus you're going to take off another one thousand eight hundred and seventy two at the request of the city of Cleveland, mm -hmm. leaving you. Uh, Leaving you at three to four thousand, or, or somewhere in that range, and 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 my question, that's that's five percent of the original eighty-one thousand, mm -hmm. and and my question is that even if if this is successful, uh, how much of an impact is uh, is doing a tax lien sale on five percent of the delinquent parcels going to have on, uh, on reducing the delinquency problem. Thank you, Rich. Uh, to the chairman, in terms of dollars, I think you could argue the impact is small. In terms of message, it's huge. We haven't had a tax lien sale since 2008. Our delinquency rate continues to grow. We have to collect delinquent taxes. A lot of it isn't, as I said, it's not about just the dollars. It's about making sure all the taxpayers know they've got to pay their share the county executive has mentioned this before. It's an issue of fairness. If 85% of our taxpayers are paying their taxes and 15% aren't, we're asking the 85% to carry the weight of the 15%. And when that goes to 20 and then 30, that becomes a challenge. So we won't reap a lot of dollars, but I think we'll um, send the message that we are going to try to collect delinquent taxes, but we want to do it the right way. We want to be fair with taxpayers. We want to communicate. We want to work with community groups. but. Um, as I stated in my opening comment, when I see that number growing, um, as your fiscal officer, that's the one that keeps me awake and concerns me is as our delinquency amount, even if you pare it down, it continues to grow. I, I think it's just a step in the right direction, but it won't be a huge dollar amount, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to make it clear that uh, 
that if done properly, I am a supporter. Uh, I just don't want us to create unrealistic expectations, and so that's uh, that's what my questions were about. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Just one question. Sorry. Just just um, so I understand, what's anticipated um, recovery of funds when you say it's relatively small? What what number are you anticipating? Uh, to the councilwoman, to the chair, uh, yes, I would conservatively say between five and ten million. If we get a bidder, we'll obviously know a lot more come Monday. I guess my comment, Mr. Chair, if I may, that right now this county is, you know, struggling to, to balance a budget and make sure services are provided to all in need. And mm -hmm. I think every dollar counts, at least this council person represents that position that I'm in favor of this. And I think with the safeguards put in place and respecting the municipality's needs with with some standards by which we can measure what those needs are i, I certainly think this is a prudent and um way to go as, as this government moves forward and bringing in dollars to do what we need to do for the county residents i'm going to ask one more devil's advocate question mm -hmm. which is that is is there any chance that suppose suppose that we didn't do the tax lien sale? Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that through uh, through our own collection methods that we would end up collecting even more money because of the fact that uh, that we would be able to get the penalties and interest, which, as I understand it. Uh, we do not collect the penalties and interest under a tax lien sale. Mr. Chair, I, I like to, uh, to let Mr. Steen handle all the devil advocate questions, so I'm going to turn it over to him. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, you raise a good point. If we were to collect, um, the one thing we found is just the mailing of the notice that uh, a certificate may be sold on your delinquent taxes has brought taxpayers in. Um, that's, a, that's a powerful incentive. I don't know if um, they haven't gotten to this point without at least receiving six bills from the county treasurer. They get their mailing each first half, second half, and delinquent. First half, second half, delinquent the second year. Some of them are three years delinquent, so they've not responded to six to nine correspondences from um, the treasurer now and prior treasurer. Uh, the tax lien uh, threat does move some, but you raise a good point. If we were to collect it, we would get some additional fees in the penalty and interest. And, it's trying to find that right balance when to use this tool, but your, your question is accurate. If we were to collect the five million, we would get a little bit more money than using um, a purchaser of tax certificates. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Chairman? Yes. Uh, Councilman Jones. Just a general question. I uh, had one constituent whose tax lien, uh, taxes were due, and it was from 08 and because of sickness. But then they paid uh, the subsequent years, and the, late, the lateness was as a result of a prior year. Mm. Uh, now, this was outside of Cuyahoga County, but oh. um, so. But my question is, do we have a similar situation in Cuyahoga? Do, can you pay 10 but not pay 9? Um, to the councilman through the chair, no, not, not in Cuyahoga County. There's a sequencing, and you always go, you know, the oldest first when payments come in. Unless okay. it was sold. If it's sold uh, to the to the councilman through the chair, if it's sold all the the purchaser pays every dime of any liability, no matter how fresh or how old. And then the taxpayer then owes owes the of course the buyer of that certificate. Now they can, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they can make arrangements through the treasurer's office for one year to pay up that amount, and we will we will work with them to spread that however we need to, to to eliminate that liability on their behalf. Yes, I, Mr. Chairman, to mm -hmm. yes, kind of clarify, mm -hmm. if someone had, was delinquent in two thousand eight and that lien was sold, mm -hmm. they would still receive a 2009 um, bill from the county, and they could pay that. To the councilman? Right. 
through the chair, there this this cell will be for all the taxes. I'm just saying, and for his situation pr prior. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. I'm sorry, Rich. No. Uh, to the councilman through the chair, you're correct. They'll still get ongoing bills, so you could pay that. Um, you have to clear the prior delinquency, but uh, unfortunately, the sequence of paying taxes continues to go forward, even if you're in a tax deficient situation. So, um, but. Rich's point was, if you get in a delinquent situation, you were to send payments to us, we'd apply it to the oldest first. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Councilman Brady. Yes, just a uh, comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, I um, um, want to um, thank uh, the, the administration in advance for the um, intense uh, reach out to the community that, that will take place um, uh, over the next uh, few days. Uh, it's important to understand um, that, of course, although this is a, an issue uh, throughout the county, particularly in uh, the city and the inner ring suburbs, that there is there are uh, organizations like the one that's represented here today that's you know around 35 years old, others that are even older. Uh, they know the community so well, and we have an unusual system um, uh, unlike Columbus, um, which I'm pretty familiar with, uh, you know, we have 19 wards, they're each over 20,000 people. The public officials uh, who represent those wards are, are, know them pretty much like the back of their hand. Uh, those of us who have contacts in Cleveland City Hall uh, can probably help out um, uh, on this issue. Uh, I think everybody wants to be helpful. Um, and uh, it's just a, the city of Cleveland is a, is a particular kind of an animal, and I can understand why, you know, re, you know talking with Chris Warren and others, um, you were certainly talking to the right people, but there's just a, there's just a history of the, of the way Cleveland is, is, um, is built, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, people that can be helpful, uh, probably in ways that in other big cities, um, uh, they, you know, they wouldn't be, and I think one of the, one of the, upsides of having regional representation uh, here in the county is that uh, we each also know you know something a little a little bit about to our communities um, and uh, and we want to be helpful to um, to work with the administration Thank you. okay anything else mr. chairman when Jones I just wanted to point out that as we had this discussion earlier in the Board of Controls on Monday one thought that came to my mind was who was the owner of the home when these tax liens take place. And if, to my understanding, the homeowner is still the owner of the home. There could be a mortgage on, on the property. Uh, and until the, this house actually goes to sheriff sale, the owner of the home is still the owner of the home. My question is, at that sheriff sale point, sometimes banks come involved, become involved and, and will pick up the property on that back end. But on the front end, tell me about these bidders, those who buy. How do you qualify them? Are these are they ten, tend to be banks themselves, some other large company? Who, how would you qualify the people who buy these tax lien sales? Okay. Uh, to the councilman through the chair, this is a really good question. And so I really want to pull up some expertise from either Wade or from the staff in terms of qualifications. If you would bear with me mm -hmm. five seconds. Uh, to, the, to the councilman, they tend to be financial-based institutions. They're going to have to f have financial strength to walk in with 5 or $10 million, a collection mechanism. Some of the things that we've put into our requirement that no other county does is we need two references. We're going to do reference checks. Um, we've also given them the opportunity to give us a two-page business plan. One of the things that we've demanded they tell us is how will you communicate and work with our taxpayers when you're collecting. In a typical com competitive bid situation, you present a fee and that's it. So that's how we're going to try to make sure we've got the right group is through the background check, through the credit check, they have the financial strength, and then um, um, the background check would include the references and the business plan. But they tend to be arms of banks, I think, is what they would be described as. And um, if I can to elaborate, you mentioned banks. One of the groups we forgot to mention we reached out to, we also sent this list to all the lending institutions in Cuyahoga County that may have mortgages. Because one of the thoughts I had was if I have a mortgage on a home, I don't want to get behind the holder of the tax certificate. So we've actually had banks come forward and are going to take care of tax delinquent situations for the homeowner so that they can make sure the homeowner stays and works with the bank and not with someone else. So we've reached out to that group this time also. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much you. for that presentation. Uh, Madam Clerk, is there any other public comment? 
But not for this meeting, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. We have a motion by uh, Councilman Greenspan, seconded by Conwell. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Madam President, what time would you like to start the regular meeting? The regular meeting will be started by the president at five minutes past six o'clock. Thank you. I am going